And uh, Anna's going to help too with the microphone. Uh, we should mention, however, are there people that need a seat? Because there are more seats available. If you want to come around here, there's a few seats up near the back. So anyone got a seat? If you, if you, if you have a seat them? next to you, can you raise your hand if you have a seat next to you? Do you, you guys want to come up? All right. So you, you can sort of the seating. Now, does anyone have a question off the top? Or can yeah, I just... I've got one right here. All right. Thank you for that presentation. Yeah. One question. What, um, looking back on it, what, if any, drawbacks has there been with the public private partnership? Something that you might have changed with now with experience? Or is it just a win win? Oh, there's, uh, no, it's, I mean, it's, in the, in the grandest sense, it's a win win, but there's always things that go wrong and always things you can do better. And so we're talking about now. 35 years of doing this, and uh, I can, there's a few things I've learned. Um, the one thing is that there's no one right answer, so I, I can't tell you, take this formula and repeat it to run the work. And that the best ones are ones that happen organically and start small. Um, I think uh, there's a few sort of givens. If it's a public park, it's, it, the public has to have the final say, so whether it's the mayor or the park's manager, always gets the final say as to what happens. Um, you know, I think you have to be careful. You have to make sure that uh, this, the public is represented on the board of the nonprofit that's your partner. Um, but on the other hand, the, you, you need some give and take on both sides. So the, the city, and you know, I'm a bureaucrat by training and by at heart, and you're really, you don't want to give up your hegemony, you don't want to give up your power. But you have to. You have to sort of say, I'm going to give some power to this other party, otherwise they're not going to have much interest in doing this thing. And by the same token, the other party has to say, I'm going to recognize that the ultimate authority lies with the mayor of the city, and then we're going to figure out who plays what roles. I think um, one of the things that can happen you know, in some of the business improvement districts, because they're dependent on the earned revenue, and there's only one or two uh, that actually have that responsibility, sometimes the thing that they bring in to earn the revenue can feel too commercial. And that's when you have to say, well, you have to be very activist in, in your dealings with the group and say, I'm sorry, you can't have that sponsor's name so big on the umbrellas or something. You have to, so there's a lot of give and take and back and forth. But overall, I'd say it's largely speaking it's a success. Um, and it doesn't always work. Sometimes a conservancy can get, get started and realize that raising the money is too difficult. You have to have um, the ability to end an agreement if it's not working on both sides. Both sides have to say, you know, with 60 days notice, we're ending this agreement because it's just not working out. But um, I would say overall, um, if you sort of have the courage to sort of make that leap, the benefits of engaging in some kind of public-private partnership where the, the public interest is paramount outweighs the, um, the drawbacks. All right, another question. Let's see if we can alternate sides now. Everything on that side seems to be totally into this. <laughs> um, where are you? Right in the front row. Oh, way up there. Julia. All right. She's uh, the chair of this little organization. Thank you. Um, so I'm interested in knowing if there are any common characteristics uh, between the parks that, that have adopted a conservancy model. So I think for us, imagining a park that is um, wholeheartedly run by volunteer teams seems like um, an extreme kind of position to take. But are there certain characteristics that make Central Park and, and others kind of ripe for that opportunity? Yeah, again, there's so many different models. And um, often I'll go to cities and, and people will say to me, we'd like to replicate in this city the Central Park Conservancy. And I say, okay. So if you have a, a major historic midtown park surrounded by 30-story buildings, most of which are occupied by uh, billionaires and millionaires who are philanthropically inclined, <laughs> you can replicate the Central Park Conservancy. <laughs> uh, so the answer is, it's, it's, always, it's almost sui generis, it's like one of a kind. Um, so, if you have lots of money across the street and that money is philanthropically inclined, willing to write a check and not worry too much about how it gets spent, that creates one possible model of being able to 
take the public money that you're putting into the park and move it someplace else, move it to the vast majority. So just to put this in context, in New York, 99% of the parks do not have a conservancy. It's about 10 parks that have a conservancy, and only four or five of those have a, the conservancy actually running the park. So I don't want to misrepresent the situation here. So what the conservancies do is they allow the city to shift the money that otherwise spent on park, Central Park to other parks. Um, but the, the majority of these public-private partnerships in, with friends of groups don't involve lots of money. Um, but I think what they all have in common is um, some kind of a formal relationship, even if it's not codified in a con contract, but some kind of formal relationship where it's understood you know, what the group can bring to it. But again, I, I really highlight the importance of it's really good to have people involved with the lives of parks because that ensures that the parks don't get short shrift at budget time. That ensures that the mayor and the office of management and budget and uh, the city council understand that these are important to the constituents and the taxpayers. Uh, could, could I actually just pick up and just ask you to elaborate a little bit about the role of volunteers in parks? Because that is certainly something that is of great interest, everyone here. And, and the fact is, there's some there's some hard stuff going on in Toronto around this, sort of linked to like permits and getting people into the park and engaged in cultivating the stewardship. And and so what I want to ask you is like, you know, what kind of approach do you think? Where is it going well in the, in the states? What's the proper role and responsibilities for the volunteers in return? What kind of access do they get to the park and program? Okay, well, that's, I'll try to answer that succinctly because it's a it's a deep question. So in, in New York, um, they have made a great effort over the years, prior to me, my predecessors, um, and then past me, thought volunteers were really important. And part of it was born out of desperation. You know, there was a time when the parks were just terrible and there was no staff, so you sort of said, we got to close the parks or bring in volunteers to help, help us maintain them. Um, a, a key development in making volunteer activities work really well was something called Partnerships for Parks, which was a program developed by the Parks Department in concert with the equivalent of Parks People, which was something called the City Parks Foundation. And basically what they did was they had people whose full-time job it was to be outreach coordinators to help work with volunteer groups, to help create volunteer groups, to give seed grants to emerging volunteer groups, to have workshops, to train Say you have a civic organization which is basically just focused on civic issues and they have a neighborhood park and they want to, they, they don't know how to engage with that park. Well, partnerships for park would hold workshops to train them how to engage with the park and to, to nurture uh, these, these park support groups. So I would say the key to an effective volunteer program is having people whose full-time job it is to engage and that, that involves both working with ongoing neighborhood groups but also with big like corporations I imagine TD Bank and others really enjoy doing things where people can come out and volunteer in large numbers. To do that, someone's got to be there at the site. There's got to be work to do. There's got to be paint and supplies and rakes, and they have to be there at 8 a.m. You know, if a, a thousand corporate volunteers show up at a, a cleanup at 8 a.m. on a Saturday, and the, the parks guys aren't there with pickup trucks full of mulch, yep. they'll never come back again. Yep. So you, you have to be able to, to meet them halfway. So you sort of have to spend money to earn volunteers. And, and just to be clear, on a very pragmatic level, like whereas the volunteers of New York are trained, they're delivering programming, like they're leading the butterfly walks, the shoreline walks, as opposed to the city staff who, who lead those walks and get volunteers that way. Like they train the volunteers to offer those services, so it's not that they right. hire the park rangers to deliver the services? No, the, the, um, the volunteers generally do stuff that's related to um, maintenance. So planting bulbs, raking, a lot of gardening takes place done by volunteers, whether it's a community garden, which is a whole different thing. But even, you know, gardening within parks. So for example, the Riverside Park Conservancy, its main focus for many years was uh, these volunteer gardeners who worked in the landscape under the direction of park gardeners. And in some cases, gardeners were funded by donations to the, to the Riverside Park Conservancy, and they're especially selected not just because they're great gardeners, but they also have good people skills. And so you have this really terrific thing where a gardener becomes a pie piper of horticulture, and suddenly it's a gardener and ten volunteers, and it's not just a few flowers, but it's an entire few acres of landscape. So uh, on the, the more technical stuff, like um, nature trails and nature centers, the volunteers tend to be like volunteer docents who work in the nature centers and stuff like that. Yeah. 
Thank you for indulging my question. Yeah. Okay, my side. All right. Uh, I would just want to thank you for coming, first of all, and uh, I'm one of the Fairmount Park Ice Masters, so uh, if you ever want to bring your puck up, we'll find you some skates and you can come skate outdoors with us. I have to learn how to skate first. We have the little T-bar thing, she'll be okay. there. Uh, I have to make a choice today. Today's also open data day, so there's an open data event over at Ryerson. And I was really impressed with your presentation, that you're actually using stats and numbers from various cities around the U.S. Um, what are your challenges in getting that kind of meaningful data out of the various bureaucracies and then comparing apples to apples when you're doing something like your park score? It's, it's a huge challenge and it took um, to develop park score. Prior to park score, uh, when I was working in the New York City Parks Department, I always wanted to be able to compare what we did with other cities and you're exactly right. It wasn't just apples to oranges, you know, it was apples to chimpanzees. I mean, it was just like completely different. You know, just nobody, nobody could speak to each other in a common language, even the difference between expense and capital budget. You could just barely rationalize. So the Trust for Public Land, this huge body of work to find a liaison in each city agency um, and to sort of really finesse that relationship and just keep at it in a very stubborn way, saying, well, that, that's not quite the information you're sure. And then, but the other thing that we were able to do is we have a really terrific GIS unit based in Santa Fe, which has access to all kinds of geographic information. And so we figure out, with the help of the city, we get the city to sort of ground truth it for us. So we look at the maps and we sort of say, we'll, we'll tell you how many of your residents live in a town of Waterloo Park, and you tell us if we're wrong. Um, so, uh, but it's, it's absolutely crucial to have that kind of information. Um, you know, we're, um, we, we sometimes do the park score exercise. So we, we're, it's, it's strictly speaking a United States thing now, but it might be interesting to take the five or 10 largest cities in Canada and compare themselves. And I suspect if Toronto were put in the park score, even with the American cities, it would be at or near the top. Just, just looking at the map and knowing what I know about your budget and stuff like that, as Toronto would score very highly on park score. very much for the presentation. I, I enjoyed it really uh, quite a lot. And it ties in, I just have a quick comment and question. I was wondering if you have heard of the Global Cities Institute and the work that Professor Patricia McCartney is doing in Toronto. I don't know if anybody from the Global Cities Institute is here, but just uh, tying in with the previous comment about Park Score, I think they're trying to do the exact same thing, but at a wider scale in order to be able to compare cities around the world to each other, so. There's a great deal of work going on right now as we speak. The, um, the U.S. Geological Survey, and there's a, an, an organization in the United States, I forget its name, sorry, that are trying to, they're trying to map all the open space in every city across the country, um, which is a really ambitious project, because some cities don't have that information. So it's, you can't upload it to those U.S. geosystems. But I, I think increasingly, Everything that people do in this field, in city planning and landscape architecture, uh, is going to be on a, on, a, on a GIS backbone. And the more sort of open source sharing of GIS information there is, the better. And this institute and many others, uh, yeah, yeah, let's face it, uh, look what's going on in Toronto. Look at this extraordinary growth spurt you've been in. You know, recession, doesn't matter what's going on. You're still adding tens of thousands of residents every year. And this is what's happening in cities around the world. So. Figuring out how cities work, how open space works, how all of this interconnects will be crucial to our survival of the planet, in particular with global climate change. Many cities in the world exist at sea level next to water bodies. Why? Because the, the historic cities started with maritime trade. We're on rivers, we're on oceans, and we are, as a result, incredibly vulnerable to uh, the increased storms and the stormwater related flooding and the storm surge flooding and we have to figure that out and part of the part of the answer will be much more sort of climate smart cities that build the barriers that we need and we have to build barriers but make them multifunctional so it's not just a big walled city but that 
that dike or that lake that you build is a bike path and it has stormwater storage facilities and, and all kinds of other things. There are multiple layers of value uh, and we have to do this rather urgently and to do that we need exactly that kind of information that gets shared. In this, really and, and, and watch how amazing this audience is. Ice storm, what percentage of the tree canopy was lost? 20. See, that's wow. smart. They're on top of it. Yes, we have extreme weather all the time here, too. Right, and you have flooding here, too. Yeah. Actually, but on this note about dense, dense cities and real estate values, how do you add parkland to a place like New York where the cost of land is so unbelievable? I mean, we have a deficit of, of land in the core. I mean, is this okay that I can ask him this question? This is very important. Okay. Yeah, well, this, how do you this, do that? This is a big change. So, in some cities, um, it's less of an issue because uh, a city like Detroit, for instance, uh, and some other cities in the United States, open space is not the problem. Too much open space is the problem. And it's a real problem. And so, but they're, again, they're, they're starting to look at open space as part of the solution, saying, let's reorganize the space of Detroit and start to rebuild our communities around these sort of, as garden communities, around purposely built new green centers. And let's land bank some of this open space with the ultimate goal of turning into different kinds of functioning open space. Now in a city like Toronto or New York, where a postage stamp size of piece of land uh, is of great value, there isn't a lot of vacant land lying around. So exactly what you're doing and what New York is doing right now is the future for the cities that are growing in population, which is the transformation of abandoned urban infrastructure. So your, your brownfields, your former factories, um, abandoned train lines. Um, these are the, the sort of marginal spaces are the, are the parks of the future. And that, you know, absent coming into downtown Toronto and, and using eminent domain to buy a private property and tearing down huge swaths of buildings to build a park, that's really what you have. And because of environmental regulations, it, you can't fill in the lake to build a big new waterfront park. So um, it's going to be at the margins. It's going to be linear parks. It's going to be uh, finding those abandoned spaces. It's going to be very expensive because of brownfields. The brownfields have to be mitigated. But it's, it's incredibly important. As you keep adding density in the city of Toronto, there isn't new open space in downtown Toronto. But you have to, so you have to really look at when developers are building new condos that there's a pretty terrific park next to it. And that maybe you can do like what they do in New York, which is the developers required not just to pay for developing that public space next to it, but it's ongoing maintenance. Because otherwise it keeps sticking the city with a tab for these new parks. Um, you'll have two choices. Raise the taxes considerably to pay for maintaining new parks or have substandard maintenance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was okay, I got a question over here. <coughs> yes, <coughs> hi. Uh, I have two questions. One is, how, how do you get the cities to realize that the friends of the parks groups are not there just to find money? Because actually, I think that is to run parks more efficiently. And actually, one of the things that friends of parks do worst is find money. They barely survive. One of the things that they do really good is get the community involved. So I think that even if they don't find any money, they are really worth having. Uh, so that's one question. And the second is, how to make sure that these extremely successful conservancy projects, like Central Park or whatever, they don't end up creating a two-tier park system where the rich areas, like where Central Park and Battery Park and Bryant Park and all of these are where the rich people live, you have the best world parks, and the low income, they don't have as good a park. So how to make sure that you really have a great park system, including the low income areas of the city? Okay, uh, two good questions, I'll, I'll answer them in reverse order. So this concern about the, the two-tiered park system is a legitimate concern. And I sort of have uh, several uh, multi-layered answer for that. One is there's a, I think, a somewhat mistaken notion that a park, the parks of New York that receive significant private support, like Central Park and Prospect Park, are parks that are paid for by rich people and only used by rich people. Because in fact, if you go to Central Park, uh, yes, there are some wealthy people living on Central Park West and Fifth Avenue, but the north end of the park abuts Harlem, East Harlem, Central Harlem, West Harlem which is primarily poor and working class people. So uh, there, there's no means test to use big public parks, big regional parks. They're, they're parks for everybody and they're, they're very well used by everybody. So it, it's sort of a, it's a, an unfair characterization to say that it's, these are, if, if wealthy people support a park, it's only for wealthy people. In fact, the wealthy people go away for the summer, right? 
And so it's working people are using a park which is subsidized by the wealthy people. So it's a pretty good deal. But the, more than that, um, the money the city would otherwise be spending on Central Park has to be reallocated to other parks. And then, you know, it's been proposed by one elected official and maybe possibly endorsed by the incoming mayor that the successful conservancy should be tithed. That is, the, the proposal was put up by a state senator that said, any nonprofit organization that has a budget of $5 million or less, 20% um, of their revenue should be taken away by the city and redistributed to other parks. Uh, aside from the questionable legality of that proposal, um, it's not going to generate very much money. It's going to alienate your donors and probably drive people who will say, you know, if I want to give money to that park, or give money to that park, and if you're going to tell me where to give my money, my, my hard-earned charitable dollars, I'm going to give it to the hospital that doesn't tell me that, hey, sorry, we're going to take your money for heart disease and reallocate it for this other more important disease. So um, I think, but I think what should happen instead is the, the successful nonprofit park organizations, to the extent that they can, and some are already doing this, should voluntarily say, hey, we're in Central Park, and there's just north of Central Park, there's Morningside Park, and St. Nicholas Park, and um, Jackie Robinson Park up in Harlem. These are beautiful old landscape parks, but they could use a little bit better horticulture. So the Central Park Conservancy sends its gardeners out of the park to help with these parks. They, they've been doing it voluntarily now for about eight or ten years. And I think something like that, where they, you sort of get a steering committee of the successful conservancies to lend both specific tactical help and advocacy and training to the other parks. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that most friends of groups can't raise a lot of money, don't have a lot of money to raise, and that's not their purpose. Uh, what they can do, though, is provide sweat equity. They can provide, you know, the, this extra work, scraping old fences to get the old paint off and repainting them, uh, planting bulbs, raking leaves, mulching, pruning, um, again, sure, demonstrating they have the techniques to do this and under the, the guidance of a, of a city gardener. Um, you know, I think you know, being on the receiving end of working with, with friends of groups, um, they have to do something of value. I mean, just, you know, telling the city what to do all the time is of a certain amount of use, but unless you're actually helping, then you're sort of taking up their, their valuable time. So you have to do something that's, you know, I often say to advocates, great, advocate all you like, but like, stand up and show us what you're actually doing. You know, what, what are you doing to actually help this park? I mean, it's easy to complain, but, you know, do something substantive rather than complaints, show what you can do. So I think, and it doesn't have to be physical labor. It could be organizing puppet shows for kids. It could be organizing temporary art installations. Anything that brings life to that park. And uh, the, the, the best parks are the parks that have maybe not 24 hours. You, you may not want to live next to a park that has parties going on all night. But seven days a week, activities, and children, and families, and dogs, and cats, and there's no cats. Um, <laughs> Um, and music, and art, and sculpture, and just this concept, and food trucks, and all these things that bring life to the park. And so there are many different things you can do, but it's got to be something. It's got to be something and, of substance. And what's the right balance for charging volunteers permit fees? What, where, where have they got it right? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to pass judgment on that, because uh, you could turn around and say the same thing about New York parks or other park systems. But you know, generally speaking, if volunteers are doing something that's helping the parks, they shouldn't be charged a fee including for you know, running events. Um, the way, so the, we have the exact same issue in New York City Parks, where a, a volunteer group would say, we want to put on an event, we need a permit for that event. And we say, okay, pay us the $25 permit fee. You know, it's just a bureaucratic handling fee for processing that. They say, geez, you know, $25 is actually even for us a lot of money. So what we would do is we would, the city would become an official co-sponsor with that group, and therefore we could sort of um, say you don't have to pay a fee. So the event brought to you by New York City Parks Recreation and you know, the Friends of Forest Park. So that's how we got around that, that technical loophole. Or we created a loophole for the technicality of the entire uh, Yeah, and like, can we have sort of an informal system like that in Toronto where there, there are ways to get the fees waived and the amazing counselors who help uh, the volunteer groups do that. But it's, it's sort of like you have to know what to do. It's unbelievable how much parks on the down low kind of goes on. Um, <laughs> Don't tell anyone we've got some going on in our park because God forbid they'll find out about it and we'll try to do it somewhere else, but that won't happen. So it'd be nice for the rules to be out and open and because there are amazing counselors who do that stuff. But I'm not sure if it's always that way. 
Uh, but you know what? I think we have to wrap it up. Is there one really short question? Really, I don't know, John. You get a big chance to talk <laughs> later. Can you make it super fast? <laughs> No, I started four minutes late. So we can wait, we're going to do three questions. John, ask it, and then you're going to answer which one you want to do. Because apparently, this John is the week. On the strategic plan for a park, uh, from your experience, what is the best um, driver of it? Is it the city? Is it um, uh, the volunteers or the uh, private developer? Okay, hold it. Hold it. All right. <laughs> that was short. That was very good. I just had a quick question of you know you make beautiful spaces like this and become very popular. So would it be a greater challenge to then deal with making a resilient park that can resist heavy use, quality issue, or if it's a broader issue of making quantity, making more public spaces that people can distribute towards? Great question. Another quick one. Yes, why don't you just shout it out there, that woman in the, yeah, yeah. Okay. I know you got it. Oh, like, and we don't have that here. It's a terrible division. Okay. okay. Can, you, uh, can you wrap it up in an omnibus answer? I'm going, to, I'm going to do that real fast. So starting with the last question. The answer is no. And for many years, uh, it was a big problem. We coveted. We saw those schoolyards, and they would get locked up at 3 o'clock every day. And particularly in neighbors that didn't have parks, this was a terrible thing. But this Board of Education was a separate bureaucracy, and it was not controlled by the mayors. Two things happened. One, uh, our mayor, Bloomberg, fought for, I don't know why he had to, glutton for punishment, fought for and got control of the Board of Education and turned it into the Department of Education. That paved the way for the city to say, aha, these 700 school grounds, school playgrounds, can now become part of a larger system. And as part of Plan YC, they put money in the budget to transform 250 part-time school yards into full-time playgrounds. So they get used by the school during the day and by the community. <laughs> But to, to sell it to the schools, the city did say, and we'll give each of the schools an extra amount of money each year for the in, in, increased maintenance they're going to have to do. But they got a beautiful new playground, and the Trust for Public Land was actually involved in, with the design and the construction of these playgrounds to still do that. So you, they need to become part of a larger system, in my belief. Quality and quantity, both. The answer is both. Um, you, you need to do as many parks as you can. And, the parks don't have to be perfect when they start. So Hudson River Park took 10 years to build. It's still not finished. But the very first thing they did was take these scrappy old piers and open them up to the public and let people just go out and do things on these old asphalt piers. So the, the first thing to do is get it into the public domain first, worry about developing it and paying for it later, you know, just make it work for the bare minimum. But then, when you have the money to spend on it, that's when you really need to stack the layers of value and you need to you start with the community, find out what the community wants, so you do the community engagement. Then you work with a really good landscape architect. And anybody any landscape architects in this room? All right, yeah. landscape architects are really important people. They can't have a great park without a great landscape architect. How's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those landscape architects know a whole lot about how to make resilient landscapes and stormwater capture and those things. And they're going to figure out how to get the most value out of this small piece of land. It's particularly important in a city like Toronto where you can't say, oh, well, this kind of park over here and that kind of park over there. Especially downtown, you've got to have that little piece of land play multiple uses. So it's both quantity and quality. But the more quality you can get in design, the better it is. Strategic plan, what are the drivers? Again, it's just, this is a related question, related answer. Um, I think, and the counselors who are still here will agree, it really has to start with the people. Um, the people who live in that neighborhood are your first and foremost constituents. But then you have to remember, the people in the neighborhood have to remember this too. In some parks, it's not just your neighborhood park, it's everyone's park. And sometimes you get, you get into this and you think, this is my park, and sorry. We don't want people from outside coming in and doing their sport in our park, and we don't like that sport. That's, all, that's not kosher, as we say in New York. Um, <laughs> and you also have to look at, oh, right, you may want this thing now, but this park has to survive for the ages of what's popular now. I mean, so let's not build the entire park into a skate park, because 10 years from now, skateboarding may be out of fashion. Let's just make sure there's room for a lot of activities. Um, and let's make sure that it's going to be maintainable, because someone's going to have to maintain it, and it's going to, play, it's going to be, again, have these multiple environmental and ecological functions. Um, and then, um, you know, ultimately, who's going to be, be maintaining and operating this park? And so you have to make sure that your 
as part of your strategic planning, the end operator or owner who has the final say, and hopefully that end owner or operator, in most cases the city, um, is open to larger possibilities. But it's, it's also not unfair for that entity to say, I need to know I'm gonna be able to maintain this. So that's what you wanna be able to make sure. If you want a really great park with, a, with very sophisticated horticultural elements, make sure there's some way down the road to pay for the maintenance of those elements. Whatever that is, whether it's a tax levy or a maintenance endowment or something else. Because it's not fair to, to say, we wanna have this really great, very fancy horticultural uh, ensemble, but you, you worry about how to maintain it down the road. That's not fair to your parks department. Thank you all very much. Amazing. Sharing a glass of free wine, he did earn. He did earn at least one glass there, uh, and you'll be able to address him uh, questions him directly at the social. So uh, stick around for that too. Yeah, and my sense is that pretty much everybody in this audience could have asked an interesting question and got an incredibly interesting response from Adrian. So thank you so much for coming up here to Toronto and sharing your knowledge, your expertise, um, your overview of, uh, of the whole parks movement in the U.S., and especially all the innovative solutions that you come up with. So once again, thank you so much for coming.